Hey everybody, I'm here with uh, Dr. Uris Bunkus at Orange County Plastic Surgery. You can find them at orangecountyplasticsurgery.com. So we're here to talk about cosmetic surgery and some of the exciting new treatments and procedures out there today. So Dr. Bunkus, thank you very much for joining us today. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to start off just by asking how long you've been working as a plastic surgeon. Since before you were born. <laughs> no, I... Um began studying plastic surgery in 1979, and um, I was board certified and uh, completed all my training in 1981, and at that point, I taught for a couple of years at University of California, San Francisco, hmm. and um, I went into private practice in the mid-80s. Okay, awesome. Was there uh, anything in particular that drew you towards that and made you want to help patients with their cosmetic goals? You know, when I went into plastic surgery, my main area of interest was head and neck reconstruction. And uh, that was for kids who had birth defects and major traumas and um, uh, skin cancers and jaw cancers and so forth. That's what really attracted me to plastic surgery. But uh, by the time I went into private practice and um, uh, chose to focus on aesthetic surgery, I had kids. And it is just so much easier to control your schedule when you're doing elective surgery than if you're yeah. uh, at a center where you're always taking care of trauma. Yeah. And that was my main motivation, but it's very, very similar to work. We're still taking heads apart and putting them back together again, yeah. kind of thing. So uh, the two meshed in quite well. Absolutely, I could definitely see that. And I wanted to find out from you, since the end of the pandemic, did you notice an increase in patients coming back in and getting procedures again? Well, I'm not sure the pandemic has ended. <laughs> um, <laughs> the during, lockdowns more so, yeah. Yeah, but during the pandemic, as soon as they opened up um, our ability to operate again, you know, for six weeks or so, we were closed down. Uh, mm -hmm. We couldn't come in, give Botox, couldn't see patients. It was just against the rules here in California. Right. Uh, but um, during that time, we received tons of emails and calls, and I answered all of those. Mm. And as soon as the doors are open, our schedules are just jammed uh, for the next until now, I guess. I mean, we're just very, very busy. Yeah, absolutely. And so you mentioned that, you know, your main focus in the beginning was, you know, the head and neck. Is that still what you primarily focus on procedures for? You know, I do a fair amount of breast surgery and uh, body contouring or so forth, but my main area of interest, what I enjoy doing the most is anything to do with the head and neck, whether it's eyes or noses or pinning ears back or so forth. Hmm. Uh, my fiance is a plastic surgeon as well, and her main area of interest is taking care of the breasts and the body, so it works pretty well for us. Yeah, definitely. You got the, the whole team there. And so with, uh, with those procedures for the, uh, like the eyes and the nose and, uh, and the ears you mentioned, what are patients typically looking for with that? Just a rejuvenated appearance or what do you typically find that they're you know, hoping to achieve with those? Well, it's different for different patients. The ones coming in with a large bump in their nose has got nothing to do with rejuvenating. They just don't like their bump or uh, if the ears protrude too much, uh, little children, six, seven years old, will be uh, coming in with their parents and um, they're teased a lot at school. You know, they're called Mickey Mouse and Dumbo and so forth. And they have a high motivation to get this fixed. Yeah. Uh, but uh, when the people come in with issues about their eyes and necks and brows, that's mainly rejuvenation. Mm. And that by definition just means looking like you used to, um, yeah. looking younger. Yeah, definitely. And with those uh, procedures for the rejuvenation ones, um, how long did the results typically last with those? And what do you recommend for patients to be able to really help, you know, maximize the results they're getting from those? Yeah, you know, when you pin ears back or you take a bump off a nose, that's a structural change. And that's right. not going to change again in the patient's life. If you mm -hmm. take a bump off a nose when they're 80 years old, the bump's not going to grow back. Mm -hmm. But when you're rejuvenating, you're lifting tissues and you're turning the clock back, you're not stopping it. Right. Um, uh, for facelifts, for example, we look at it as making a patient look like they used to about 15 years earlier, okay. with the exception that the texture of the skin doesn't change. So mm -hmm. if you live in Arizona and play golf and tennis and your skin is really wrecked, well, if you have a facelift, you're not going to have nice, smooth skin again. 
Mm -hmm. um, but the sagging, the contour part, you will bring back about 15 years. And from that point forward, you continue to age. You don't stop. Mm -hmm. um, and if you have an identical twin, and if you do a procedure and your twin doesn't, you will from that moment look about 15 years younger than your twin. Mm -hmm. If you come back 25 years later, your twin will look 25 years older, but you will look 10 years older. You know, you always maintain right. that uh, relative uh, improvement to someone who has not had a procedure. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And I know with the, the facelift specifically, there's a few different, um, you know, techniques you can do with that. What is, you know, the average surgical and recovery time with those? Uh, well, you mentioned different techniques. Some people do what they call mini lifts where they don't undermine very much and they're doing very, very little. And if you just cut under your skin for an inch or so and tug the skin a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, you will heal very quickly because you haven't undermined the facial tissues. Um, if you undermine the entire cheek and lift all the muscles up and um, uh, do a more thorough uh, procedure, mm -hmm. uh, you're gonna be bruised and swollen for 10 days to two weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, but those results will bring you back 15 years and you're gonna have an improvement for the rest of your life. If you just tug in the skin a little bit a year or two later, you look just like you would have otherwise. You know, it doesn't, um, doesn't do anything long-term. So for most people, that's not a very good option. Yeah, that makes sense. And so with the ones that you do, is there a specific technique that you like to perform or do you base that more off of the patient themselves and what they're looking to achieve? Uh, what the patient's looking to achieve and what their anatomy uh, gives me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, somebody has a lot of mid-cheek drooping, you're gonna add a mid-face lift where you're lifting this part as well. It made most of the issues down in the neck and the jowl area. You lift the SMAS up and you do that whether you go under the SMAS or plicate it on top. There's different technical ways that you can achieve the same uh, result. Mm -hmm. and I think when you talk about facial rejuvenation, it's important to understand why people sag and mm -hmm. people think their skin is sagging. Skin goes with a muscle layer that's underneath the skin that sags. And there's a very thin layer of muscle that starts in our cheek and goes down into our neck. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not really attached to bone. You can't exercise it in shape. Mm -hmm. uh, you can be 75 years old and lift weights every day and uh, pedal on a bike and keep you know, your muscles strong. Mm -hmm. But that muscle, you can't exercise. If you look at your face, you're young, your face looks like a V because all the fullness is up in here. And if you look at your dad's face, he looks a little bit like a pear. Well, the fullness has fallen down here. And you look at your grandfather, it's all the way down here. Right. And it's that muscle that sags. And if you do a thorough facelift, what you're going to do is uh, open up the skin, give yourself exposure. But the work is on lifting that muscle underneath the skin. It's not on tugging the skin. And you go tug the skin too hard. You look like you're sitting in a wind tunnel and you don't look like you used to 15 years ago. You look like you've never looked. Right. It's kind of a scary look that I don't particularly like to give my patients. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And um, so with those uh, patients that do that, you know, who would you typically say is a good candidate for those uh, treatments versus, you know, somebody that should just do maybe like fillers or Botox? Sure. There's two factors. One is your anatomy. And if I look at somebody and they're asking me to do a face that they don't have sagging, I'll tell them they're not a candidate. Mm -hmm. And number two, it has to bother you enough to want to do it. There are a lot of people who are sagging, famous movie stars that we know who are sagging and so forth, mm -hmm. and they're not very bothered by it. They're not good candidates for a procedure. But if someone is bothered by it and um, they have the physical problem that I can fix, they're awesome candidates for the procedure. Okay, definitely. And then as far as, um, you know, overall kind of health and, and mental health as well, what would you typically say is, is needed for those? Well, they both have to be in good shape. Yeah. Uh, you don't want to operate on somebody who has unrealistic expectations or uh, has, you know, I've operated on people who are being treated for psychiatric illnesses um, with um, uh, cooperation of their psychiatrists and that they're stable at the time and they have real realistic expectations and so forth 
But you do see some patients that come in that uh, don't see a psychiatrist, don't have any diagnosable illnesses, but they just have unrealistic expectations. Right. And uh, it's best that those people not have a procedure. Uh, and same thing goes for general health. There's no upper limit. I've done facelifts on people in their 90s, hmm. um, but their general health has to be excellent. And um, if you have a bad heart or your diabetes is out of control, your blood pressure is out of control, I don't care if you're 35 or 40 years old, you shouldn't have a procedure. You should take care of your health first. Yeah. You know, for body contouring, for example, I see a lot of patients that will come in and they're asking me for lipo and their bellies look like little beach balls. Mm -hmm. I will always have a very detailed conversation with them first about diet and exercise and healthy living. Yeah. And I pay for it. I buy many of those patients a book that was written by a doctor by the name of Stephen Gundry that's called Plant Paradox. And it just teaches you the value of certain foods. And if you follow the recommendation, recommendations in a book like that, you can easily lose a lot of weight. Yeah. I always give the patients an opportunity to try to lose weight before they jump into a procedure. So uh, in summary, you're supposed to be mentally healthy and you have to be physically healthy. You have to give it your best shot before you ask for an elective procedure. Yeah, absolutely. Do you find that most patients are willing to compromise on those and really work on that before having a procedure? Is that just completely turn them away from it? The, the minority will actually read the book and follow through. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, I had one gentleman in Middle Eastern um, descent who saw me about six months ago and um, had one of those big, I call it a beer belly, but um, I don't know if he drank beer, just ate too much, but just yeah. a round protuberant abdomen mm. wants a liposuction. You pinch the outside of this uh, fatty layer. It's only half an inch thick. Yeah. He has a bunch of fat on the inside from mm. not being healthy. Right. I had him read that book and he came back six months later, lost 70 pounds, wow. uh, had a bunch of loose skin mm. that he didn't like that I could address for him. Right. Uh, but his main problem was uh, lack of eating properly, and that was fixed. Hmm. For him, that's a lifetime cure because he's not going to go back to doing what he did before when he can see what he can do by eating well. So that's very satisfying for us as physicians to see that kind of transformation. Yeah, absolutely. And I really appreciate you guys, you know, being focused on patient education and making sure that you are setting realistic expectations for patients. Oh, absolutely. Otherwise, it's a big headache for us afterwards, and it's not good for the patient, you know? Yeah, definitely. And so for a patient that's maybe thinking they're going to be a good fit for either like those facial procedures or the body contouring ones, what would you recommend as their first, you know, best step in that process? Well, it really depends on what bothers the patient the most, you know? Um, I've seen a lot of patients who have a droopy neck and little bags under their eyes. And they couldn't care less about their neck. They just want their eyes fixed. I don't even mention the neck to them unless they yeah. mention it to me. Uh, we just go ahead and um, um, talk to them about the part that bo bothers them. Yeah. Um, and uh, likewise with, um, um, you know, breast surgery or whatever else. If somebody comes in, has a big belly and they have droopy, droopy breasts, I'll talk to them about what they talk to me about. Mm. I won't bring something else up. Yeah, people have concerns about two or three things. Mm -hmm. Frequently, it's economically um, beneficial and time-wise, healing-wise for the patient to combine procedures. Yeah. So if you just like your tummy and your breasts, and if you want to do them at the same time, mm -hmm. you have one surgery center fee, which will be less than mm -hmm. two fees put together, uh, right. And your recovery time for both procedures will be the same as a tummy by itself. So you don't have to go through it twice. So we will tell the patients, if you're sure you want to do both, do them at the same time. If you're yeah. not sure you want to do one or the other, please don't do the one you're not sure about because it's not medically necessary. Right. Okay, that definitely makes sense. And what would be the best way for patients to get in contact with you? Uh, we have a website, uh, orangecountyplasticsurgery.com. Uh, and they can uh, call us on our office line, 949-888-9700. Um, I give every patient my email address and my cell phone number. I don't have too many patients calling me. Um, 
inappropriately. It happens very, very rarely. And that's why I'm not afraid to give my uh, patients my number. Mm -hmm. uh, but I accept uh, emails from my patients every single day. I probably get 25, 30 of them every single day. Yeah. And I answer questions and educate them about procedures and so forth. And um, we also do virtual consultations because we get a lot of patients from out of town. Um, so the staff can set up a virtual consultation or we can see them in person, whatever kind of suits the patient the best. Okay, definitely. Yeah, it's very clear to see that you care, you know, a lot about the patients, you want to make sure they have a good experience and that they're, they're able to reach you. So yeah, I definitely appreciate that. Perfect. Well, yeah, those are the questions I had for you. So I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us and share the education. That was great. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks.